very, very excited to be here. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here. This is our very first online event. And uh, I would like to, to say some words for you before we start. Uh, as teachers, many of us believe that our job is to teach language. This is fair enough. In our case, as teachers of English, um, this is already a lot of responsibility, you know? While we are glad to teach the language, we understand our role as educators goes beyond that. We are sometimes role models, parents, friends, guides, just to name a few. Something we all hate as teachers is when our students assume we are walking dictionaries because we are not. Not knowing a word or an, or an expression does not mean we are bad teachers. We don't know everything. And uh, most importantly, we don't want to know everything. Uh, that's something about us teachers. We like to keep hungry. We know how wonderful learning opportunities are, and this is with great pleasure we decided to take them. Teachers don't know everything, and the world is changing fast. How can we deal with the fact that Brazil has one of the highest murder rates against LGBTQIA people? Shut it our, shutting down our eyes to hate is not an option at all. Changing the world. It may be utopian, but that's why many of us have become teachers, right? We know that one person cannot change the world alone, but we believe in the power of education. We keep going, making our best efforts to open and shape minds one at a time. Let's change the world, shall we? Make it a place where no one feels bad because of their sexuality, because of their gender, because of their identities. A world where we can be truly proud of. A revolution of love, I dare say. Starts when we learn, when we listen, and when we connect. We then realize we are not so different after all. That our differences don't have to segregate, but be celebrated. Um, to start off, guys, this idea of having a, 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 an event that celebrates gender, uh, sexuality, and identity start when our 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 friend Ila Coimbra went to the IATFO conference last year or this year, if I'm not mistaken. It was this year, April, right? And uh, she she attended Thorsten's presentation. And also when Tiago, our moderator, attended a talk uh, given by Isadora and Elton from Casas Thomas Jefferson at the Brasil International Conference. This is sparkled a lot of, of discussion in the community. And then we decided to create this event to raise awareness to these topics. So without any further ado, we are proud to announce that one of our many attempts to change the world, our very first Brown Queer Day, Starts now, and uh, I'll pass the, the 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 floor to Ila, who's going to introduce our very first speaker. Up to you, Ila. Thank you, thank you, Bruno, very much. Your your words almost brought me to tears. Very beautiful words. Uh, well, um, hi everybody. Thanks for attending. It's a privilege and uh, um, uh, an honor to be here. Uh, and I'm going to present our very first speaker, which is Thorsten, uh, from Germany. Thorsten is our research assistant and the chair of TEFL in the Munich University. He's also an active member of IATEFO, uh, and he uh, presents workshops and talks on a regular basis, normally on the topic of queering ESOL. Okay, so I don't want to take his time to talk. <laughs> Without any further ado, Torsten, now it's up to you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. I'm Torsten speaking to you from Munich in Germany. Uh, thank you, Ila, for your kind introduction. I'm really happy that we met at this year's IATF conference in Birmingham. This is, I think, the reason why I'm speaking to you here now. Um, kind of sparking the international connections that relate to querying English language teaching. Um, 
And also thank you, Bruno, for your inspiring words. Uh, you really pointed out quite well that querying ERT has a lot to do with changing education. Um, and I hope that I can mirror this call for changing education in my talk too. Uh, so now I will go into the presentation mode and bridge the 10,000 kilometers at lie between Munich and Sao Paulo by using modern media. <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Um, the aims and the overview of my talk. Um, first of all, I would like to provide a few general considerations about what it means to queer English language teaching. Um, and I would like to offer a few theoretical insights and also provide insights into research that has been carried out uh, in the light of queer theory or queer pedagogy. Um, unfortunately, there is little research available. It's quite an under-researched field, but there is some research that we can draw on. Um, and I will use this research as a basis for any queer-informed pedagogy. Um, and similarly, there hasn't been much published on how to queer the classroom in practice. Um, so therefore, the question still is, how can we actually queer the classroom? Because this is a new educational challenge. And as far as I see, there is not much practical knowledge or experience available as yet. Um, and what we did prior to this talk is we collected, with the help of ELA, uh, a few questions and personal experience by committed uh, Brazil ELT teachers. And what I will do is refer to their questions in my talk and try to provide answers to these questions. And the overall aim is to stimulate you and to, to think and rethink about queer and ELT. Uh, I think you all have some ideas about how it could be done, how it might be done, and maybe my talk can help you to provide a differentiated view on the topic and provide you with uh, ideas that you can draw on. Um, let me begin with the first question that I think is very powerful as a general kind of structure or guideline for the whole talk. The question is, how can we make teachers aware of the importance of discussing gender, uh, identity, and sexuality in class? Um, and I think this points out really nicely um, that we first of all need to think about the importance of teaching queer. Why is it an important issue? Why does it have to become a part of uh, the classrooms in which we teach English as a foreign or second language? Um, so why is it educationally relevant, not just on a personal level, but really also on an educational level? Um, and maybe we can take this question as um, something that can run through the whole talk. Uh, and a first answer can be found in um, a definition of what we might understand by learning. Um, I think if we take this perspective, we can really base any queer um, attempt to ELT on that definition. Um, so I had a look at Hume's definition of learning, and he says that schools exist partly to extend, not simply confirm experience. And this invol involves exposing youngsters to alternative ways of life and values different from those encountered at home. This may sometimes be an uncomfortable learning experience, which in the short term causes some confusion. However, the process of working through that confusion within a supportive environment can stimulate serious thinking and serve as the basis for deep learning. The notion that all learning can be smooth and unproblematic is one that misrepresents the nature of the process. Engaging with challenging subjects can be disturbing, but it can also be uh, intellectually liberating. Uh, I think this understanding of learning shows nicely that we as teachers can challenge the status quo of teaching and learning, introduce new topics. Um, and Hume says that these new topics that introduce students to alternative ways of being might cause some confusion. But this is where learning begins. When there's a moment of confusion, um, new insights can be generated, new knowledge can come in. Um, and as schools and as teachers, in schools and as teachers, we can provide this supportive environment that can kind of lead students uh, to discover um, new knowledge about queer and LGBT issues. Um, let me now turn to a few theoretical insights. 
uh, when we think about querying English language teaching, I think it's very uh, helpful to know what the term or the concept of heteronormativity means. Um, heteronormativity can be understood as a powerful social regulation system um, that kind of requires people to have one sexual identity and only one sexual identity that is heterosexuality uh, and also follow uh, a binary gender order so that people actually have to decide whether they are or want to be or live as either female or male with no in-betweens. Um, and in society these norms of how to be sexually and how to be uh, how to have a gender uh, are privileged and they appear natural while all other identities or phenomena outside this so-called heterosexual matrix uh, can be considered logical impossibilities. This is, um, um, these are the words of Judith Butler that I'm using here. Um, but the point is that these logical impossibilities actually do exist. There are LGBT people, there are queer people out there. Uh, and what they do is they challenge heteronormativity because they um, represent alternative ways of being other than heterosexual or strictly female or male. Um, and when we transfer the notion of heteronormativity to English language teaching, uh, there's research by Gray, John Gray, who explored English language teaching textbooks, whether uh, there are any instances in these textbooks where lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans phenomena or identities are visible. Um, and sadly, he found out that it's almost completely invisible in global ELT course books. And he comes to the conclusion that course books follow heteronormative patterns. In other words, that when it comes to families, for example, or the topics of dating, flirting, uh, they are all heteronormative, suggesting that there are only uh, heterosexual relationships possible in the microcosm that the textbooks create. Um, and this is certainly something that we can critically think about in view of overcoming the heteronormativity of ELT textbooks or also generally in, in classroom interaction. For example, some teachers ask their students to um, describe their ideal partner and rather than phrasing it like boys, how would your ideal wife look like and girls, how would your ideal husband look like, because that's strictly heteronormative, uh, you can rephrase it in a more open way such as how should your ideal partner look like so that everyone um, can use the openness of that situation and talk about their ideal partner, whoever that might be. Um, another very important concept has been introduced by Cynthia Nelson. Uh, and by the way, Cynthia Nelson is one of the most widely published researchers on issues of sexual identity uh, and querying English language teaching. So if you're really m very much into uh, following up research that is already out there, uh, Nelson is a very good starting point. Uh, and she introduced the notion of the ELT or EFL classroom as a monosexual space. Uh, and what she means by this is that even though there might be diverse realities in the classroom with various learner identities and experience in view of LGBT or queer, what usually happens is that teachers still imagine the classroom to be heterosexually, heterosexual only with only female and male students. And I think Nelson really challenges all teachers to rethink how they imagine their classrooms to be like, that there are not just heterosexual male or female students in the class, but a much broader range of uh, gender or sexual identities. The sad thing is that they often um, become invisible or are made invisible, that they are silenced, that they can't speak as LGBT in the classrooms. Um, and this is also reflected in a lot of materials and texts used in the classroom. And the question is, do the texts and materials that are used for teaching English actually represent a monosexual world in which only heterosexual people appear, in which only female or male people appear, or do I actually use materials or texts that uh, exceed uh, the idea of the monosexual world and uh, introduce other gender or sexual identities? So if we try to think about where are instances in our teaching in which we reproduce or recreate monosexual spaces, 
or are there any instances where we can actually overcome monosexual spaces by introducing other sexual and gender identities. Um, another important insight provided by queer-oriented research is the idea of queer inclusion and queer inquiry. Um, and this simply means that, or queer inclusion means that um, LGBT identities are included uh, in teaching and learning processes. This means that we give voice to LGBT students that they can speak as LGBT, but also that we include uh, queer phenomena via text or materials to achieve a general visibility of LGBT identities and phenomena in the classroom. Um, but at the same time, next to acknowledging that LGBT identities exist and that LGBT learners exist, um, researchers also stress that just queer inclusion is not enough. Uh, and they say that we also need something that one could call queer, queer inquiry or that is called queer inquiry. Uh, and this is generally a very critical mode, a very curious mode marked by curiosity in the classroom in which we allow learners or provide opportunities for learners to explore heteronormativities and to explore the meanings that are attached to sexual and gender identities. And this actually means, simply put, that we discuss LGBT identities, that we talk about them uh, and everything that relates to these identities. Um, and I think the combination of both um, makes a queer focus or queer oriented education very powerful that we first of all include um, queer and LGBT identities and phenomena and then allow for this critical queer inquiry. Um, um, last but not least, another theoretical insight, uh, oh, no, sorry, um, just to give you an example about how queer inclusion and queer inquiry can work. Um, sometimes what you find in course books are depictions of families or family trees. Uh, it's a very kind of popular way of introducing the vocabulary related uh, to talking about uh, families and family relationships. Um, and maybe you can just try to imagine any of these family trees as they might appear in course books. Uh, and they usually represent families as heteronormative with the mother and the father two children, usually a boy and a girl, maybe a dog. Um, and from a queer inclusion perspective, uh, this would mean that you complement or add to these heteronormative family trees by including alternative ways of being a family, such as LGBT families, members of rainbow families, uh, a lesbian aunt, a gay uncle, a gay brother, a lesbian brother, a transgender family member, and so on. Whereas queer inquiry would mean that you work with the existing heteronormative family tree as it is uh, and then lead learners to discover what is missing by asking, is this family tree of a traditional family the only thing that we see in society, the only thing, the only available norm in society? And maybe this queer inquiry approach can then lead learners to describe what other families are out there. Um, and this links to another important question that one of you raised. Uh, the question was how to deal with kids from homoparental marriages when they are happy saying they have two moms or two dads, uh, but school is not ready to talk about it. Uh, and I think introducing uh, kind of multi-sexual family trees, if you want to use that word, uh, is a powerful way of uh, or to give um, these children a voice so that they see their family experience represented in the classroom. Um, and on the right hand side you can see uh, a few picture books that represent rainbow families um, and maybe you could use these picture books also in your classroom uh, to broaden the range of families that become available in the classroom. For example, Entango makes three uh, about two penguins in a New York zoo that, two, two male penguins in a New York zoo uh, that can't get children and then they receive an egg that wasn't taken care of and then they hatch the egg and then become parents. And then there is Donovan's Big Day and Heather has two mummies uh, focusing on, on lesbian parenting and Dad David, Baba, Chris and me uh, focusing on gay parenting. And maybe you could uh, consider using these books when you talk about families the next time in your classrooms. Um, uh, another theoretical insight is that we try to think about sexual literacy 
uh, as a learning objective. And this could entail that you empower learners to understand, communicate about, and participate in discourses that relate to sexual and gender identities or queer uh, cultural phenomena. And just to give you an example, uh, when the Olympic Games took place in Rio de Janeiro, I followed a lot of news websites, websites uh, and they frequently talked about LGBT athletes uh, participating in the Olympic Games and talking about the experience that LGBT athletes have while participating in the Games. Uh, and this is one example of the various discourses that are out there that you can introduce into the classroom and help students to understand, communicate about, and participate in them. Uh, and this sexual literacy also includes an awareness of the role of language to make or shame identities. Um, and this leads me to uh, another example or, or question. Um, one of you asked, how should my approach be to kids, teens, or adults that are making fun or talking trash about gay people? I mean, the way I should approach it in order to spark a conversation and raise awareness, but not being a political correct freak, running the risk of killing the mood. Um, and here what research suggests is uh, that we take these kind of LGBT moments as critical incidents, and rather than stopping the conversation, or silencing the topic, the idea is to actually follow up uh, gay unfriendly or LGBT unfriendly remarks. For example, if a student says, this homework task is so gay, obviously using the word gay uh, to talk badly about homework, this also implies a lot of shame, maybe homophobia. Um, and here the idea is that teachers actually use these homophobic remarks as windows of opportunity. Uh, to challenge what the students have said. For example, by asking, oh, you just said gay in relation to homework. Can you explain what that means? Uh, are you aware of the implications this might have? Because you might shame other people uh, in the classroom who uh, now or later might identify as gay. And the important thing is to follow it up and not to silence it, because if a homophobic remark is silenced, this sends out a message to all other learners that homophobic remarks are okay, but if the teacher tries to challenge it and ask the students what he means by it, um, this could be done in a more clever way than just being uh, politically correct and saying, we don't use that word in our classroom. Um, um, another question is, uh, why English language education? Why should we be concerned with queer and LGBT issues in English language education? Uh, first of all, there's a close link between language and identity. Um, and this, simply put, means that we use language to create our identities, to speak about who we are, to create ourselves whenever we enter a dialogue. Uh, and this certainly also includes sexual and gender identities uh, and the ability to talk about yourself and other people's identities. Um, the good thing about uh, English language education is that we have a principal openness as regards the topics that we cover in our classroom, as opposed to other subjects such as biology or chemistry. Here the topics are pretty much set. Uh, but in English language education we can choose whatever topics we want um, in order to get people speak, in order to foster communication, to learn grammar, to learn new vocabulary. Uh, and if we have a principal openness as regards topics, why don't we choose those topics that are educationally relevant? Um, and here I received a very uh, noteworthy remark by one of you. Um, and I was asked, uh, are you aware of the project Escola San Partido, excuse my Portuguese, uh, in Brazil? It's basically a collaborative initiative of students and parents concerned about the degree of political and ideological contamination of Brazilian schools at all levels from the upper to basic education. Uh, and when I read that there is such an initiative in Brazil, I was really, f I began to feel worried because uh, what we need to be aware about that um, education is probably always political um, and that if we cannot talk about relevant social issues in class anymore because they are deemed ideological, then the question is, what is 
left to talk about and how can we still achieve education in the fullest sense of the word if we can't allow our students anymore to think critically about the most relevant social, cultural issues of our times. Um, okay. Um, and another reason why we should worry about queer in the context of English language education is that uh, if we want to have a move towards inclusion and diversity generally in all school subjects by acknowledging diverse sexual and gender identities, then we should also claim that this inclusion and diversity extends to English language education as well and includes sexual and gender identities. Um, and there were a few remarks that I received by you that claim that many schools already have a policy of inclusion and diversity and maybe this is a starting point to include sexual and gender diversity as well. Uh, and another thing is that we should think about we want to make sure that all learners are invested in learning the language. This is the idea of investment has been put forward by Norton and Tui uh, who claim that for example if a gay or lesbian or trans student feels uncomfortable and unsafe in a classroom that's perceived to be trans or homophobic, then this student or this student's learning success might probably be limited. Um, okay. Um, now let's turn to possible oppositions to career in English language teaching. Uh, in reading um, your questions and experience, uh, I could really sense the anxiety that you feel when it comes to querying uh, English language teaching, um, indicating that it's probably not an easy subject, that it might be a tricky or very delicate hot button topic uh, in school and English language teaching classrooms. Uh, and the quote that I brought here illustrates this well. Uh, how to deal with the school community. And by school community, I mean the school staff and parents of our students that tend not to support this kind of debate in classes. Sometimes the students aren't actually our biggest challenge, which is a good thing, <laughs> uh, due to the fact that they are kids or teens, but the people who surround them are. Sometimes we face entire classes constituted by students whose religious backgrounds are really traditional and strong. Uh, how to approach the theme of gender and acceptance within a sort of hostile environment like this. Um, and rather than having a ready-made fixed answer to these questions, I would like to point out the factors that might come into play as opposition when you want to queer English language teaching. Um, first of all, the sensitivity of the topic itself. As I said uh, just a moment ago, uh, many people still think this is a hot-button topic, a taboo topic that no one dares to talk about. Um, and in my experience as a teacher educator preparing students for their future job as a teacher, uh, many of these students actually have never considered introducing LGBT issues uh, in their classrooms because no one has ever told them that this could be a possible element uh, of English language teaching. And as soon as they were aware that this could be introduced in the classroom, uh, they had this awareness that it's kind of necessary to sense where queer can be included. Um, another issue is, or a factor, are teachers and educators themselves. Uh, every teacher is or has a sexual and gender identity um, with certain beliefs and values, uh, and these values might certainly impact on any approach uh, to querying English language teaching. Uh, and here, probably what I can say or suggest is that all teachers and educators, first of all, reflect on their own values, on their own norms uh, when it comes to sexual and gender identities because the, these norms certainly impact on the way you teach uh, about LGBT issues. Uh, and then it's the learners uh, who, come from, who might come from various backgrounds that either oppose or endorse querying English language teaching. Um, the school environment might be an inhibiting factor when the general climate at school is hostile. Um, parents are frequently discussed as a major issue um, um, because usually parents um, are imagined to be against any attempt that might introduce sexual or gender diversity into schools, into classrooms, usually connected with the fear uh, that their children might kind of get the wrong idea, if you want to put it that way. Um, um, 
uh, sometimes educational goals and curricula um, either endorse or prohibit um, introducing LGBT um, topics or queer topics in the classroom. Um, and generally, the political and social climate um, might also uh, inhibit queer and English language teaching. Um, and as you might kind of see from all these various factors that might oppose queer and English language teaching, uh, some of these are very difficult to change overnight. Um, but still, we can use these factors for close analysis, uh, because these factors allow us to as teachers to think about how is my school environment like, how are my, my parents like, how are my learners like, uh, and by really understanding how these factors work, uh, you can come to good conclusions about querying English language teaching um, to introduce the topic sensitively. Uh, and this is, I would like to use this to point out the impossibility of actually defining a prescriptive pedagogic approach to teaching queer, which always works. Uh, and point out the necessity to find individual and context-sensitive ways of teaching queer. And uh, the following part of the presentation will go into that direction. And rather than providing ready-made recipes that always work, uh, maybe you can understand my uh, impulses as strategies for teaching queer, which you can adapt and use in your various contexts. So what you could do is, first of all, uh, do a close reading of existing curricular educational documents and school laws or laws in general, uh, and see if there's anything in these curricula that could legitimize and endorse uh, a focus on LGBT or queer issues and identities in the classroom. Uh, sometimes what you find in curricula is an endorsement of diversity at large, uh, and this could be a point of entry to also introduce sexual and gender identities into existing diversity paradigms. Um, and just to explain the issue of curricula a bit further, in Germany we recently had uh, quite a few federal states that introduced new curricula that endorse sexual diversity uh, in education and make the teaching about or of sexual diversity actually an educational requirement. Uh, and so we arrive at a somewhat odd situation globally that there are some educational contexts that prohibit any attempt to queer the classroom that are very restrictive when it comes to queering the classroom, whereas other countries make it an educational norm to actually do that thing. Mm. Um, okay, the uh, other thing you could do is build a strong community of practice and a platform to share ideas and concerns. Uh, and maybe this Brazil ELT seminar could be a starting point for building or establishing and continuing such a community in which, in which committed teachers share experience, share teaching ideas and their concerns um, uh, in order to kind of uh, feel comfortable and welcome in a community that supports these issues. Uh, what is also possible is that you might want to try to establish a queer-friendly coalition at school. Uh, I think the most difficult or overpowering thing is to be alone in your school to context and be the only person who follows a queer agenda, if you want to call it that way. Um, and maybe you can find a few kindred spirits um, that share the same educational vision. And if you form such a coalition, a queer-friendly coalition at school, this could be a powerful basis to introduce step-by-step -step, uh, queer uh, approaches uh, to school life and classroom life. Um, another important thing is, um, as far as I see it, uh, that US teachers should always be prepared to legitimize why teaching queer has a place in your classroom. Um, and from my own experience with uh, future teachers, um, usually it's the parents that um, worry them the most. Uh, and if you have one or two or three good reasons why you teach queer in your classroom that you can show the parents in a convincing way, um, you at least can uh, support and legitimize why you teach queer. Um, and an important help might be to argue professionally. What you could do is draw on existing English language teaching research to show that teaching queer is an established 
part of the profession and that a good professional English language teacher also has to pay attention to queer or LGBT issues in the classrooms because that is uh, an important aspect of good ELT practice. And if you argue professionally, uh, in addition to all other arguments that you might have, uh, this could put together a powerful parcel um, that you can use to oppose the opposition. Um, and maybe I can draw your attention to uh, a very recent article that has been published by Cynthia Nelson in the journal Language Issues uh, titled LGBT Content, Why Teachers Fear It, uh, Why Learners Like It, um, which kind of suggests uh, a binary opposition between teachers who oppose uh, the topic, which is um, obviously not always the case because many teachers actually embrace queer issues, uh, and in opposition to that, why learners like it. Um, and I can just recommend this article as a very empowering, empowering read uh, because it might give you um, a lot of important uh, background knowledge in favor of teaching queer. Um, let me now turn to a few practical considerations. As I said in the introduction to my talk, the big question of how to teach queer still remains largely uh, unsolved. Um, and because research isn't that widespread uh, and not many uh, queer-informed teaching suggestions have been published, have been tested, um, this is still on the level of suggestions mainly, uh, but maybe these suggest suggestions can um, uh, spark interest in the whole field. Um, one of these implications is to think about do I want to teach the LGBT lesson once uh, in the whole school career of the students? Uh, or do I want to kind of slip in queer themes every now and then so that it becomes a constant but not too explicit part of everyday teaching? Um, the LGBT lesson uh, sometimes runs the danger of exoticizing queer issues, especially if the lesson is introduced, something like, today we're going to talk about a very delicate issue, and that is being gay or lesbian, um, which might set the scene for that lesson in a very weird way. Uh, and my suggestion is that you try to think about what topics do I teach anyway in the classroom, uh, and how can I use these topics as a kind of springboard to introduce queer themes as a natural complement of these topics that you deal with anyway. Uh, for example, if you focus on, or if you teach about famous people, uh, celebrities, it's a very common topic uh, in English language teaching, uh, what you could do is also introduce a few LGBT celebrities into the range of celebrities that you talk about. Uh, and the teaching example that I will give in the end illustrates how this can be done. Um, uh, other practical implications might be to think about uh, achieving small steps one at a time or the big change all at once. Uh, when we consider the various factors that might oppose any attempt to teach queer, uh, it might be advisable to think about small steps um, that we uh, try to put into practice bit by bit rather than our educational utopic vision to change everything within one day or overnight. Um, another possibility might be uh, let the interest in queer themes emerge from your students. Um, this could take away the burden from you as a teacher to introduce uh, queer topics yourself. Uh, what you could do is uh, compile reading lists uh, in which some books have LGBT content and then have your students choose what books they want to read. This has worked quite successfully um, in a few classrooms whose teachers I know. Um, what you could also do is when you explore sociocultural diversity in general, that you ask your students what aspects of diversity can be included when we think about diverse societies uh, and maybe uh, queer or LGBT issues um, emerge from the students themselves as soon or as long as they are given the chance to include these uh, positions. Mm. What is generally helpful is to develop a stock of teaching materials with queer themes. Uh, whenever you come across a music video, 
a song, an article, or anything um, like that. Uh, try to save it, <laughs> and then uh, develop this stock that you can always draw on, uh, because as we um, learned in the very beginning, existing and published instructional materials usually do not include any LGBT or queer perspective. Uh, and so the challenge is that teachers select these materials themselves and turn them into uh, productive lesson sequences that they then might share with other teachers so that the wheel doesn't have to be invented from scratch each and every time again. Mm. Another very interesting but also difficult question is, um, which I included here, is um, the teachers themselves, uh, especially if teachers themselves identify as uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans. The question is whether they should be open to their students about their orientation and should mention their struggles and victories or as queer, uh, or whether teachers should be open with their students, whether they, in, in case they want to be open with their students. Um, and I think this is a very delicate question to answer um, because it's a highly individual, personal decision um, what, whether to come out or not in class. Um, the, the general problem is, I think, that whenever you have the feeling that you censor yourself um, and can't be who you are in the classroom and you feel really bad about it, um, you might consider taking the step to actually do that, but this is not a recommendation. Uh, this is really th something that you have to decide uh, for yourself. Uh, it's just the general problem that sometimes teachers are partners in communicative settings, uh, and when you talk about your free time, your family, and your friends, and you have the feeling that you have to constantly invent alternative stories uh, just to avoid the fact that you are LGBT, um, this is quite an unfair situation, and this is what might cause teachers to think about whether to come out. Uh, but as I said, this is a highly individual choice that is um, linked to all the other factors that might also impact on teaching career generally, such as how would the parents react, how would the teachers and colleagues react. Uh, and I think what is generally needed is um, a safe space, a safe environment at school where teachers can generally be at ease with who they are. But this is probably more than more a utopic vision than existing reality. Um, uh, and now I would like to introduce one teaching idea that I recently uh, developed. Uh, it's about uh, famous LGBT people and how we can engage learners in the experience and life stories of famous LGBT people. Uh, and the overall outcome of that lesson sequence would be to write a magazine article about the experience of LGBT celebrities with publicly being out. Uh, and here you can see quite well that we still teach English and we still teach communicative competences, in this case writing. Um, and the idea is that we still teach our students to write, in this case a magazine article, uh, but that we use the openness of content in ELT and have them write an article about famous LGBT people and their experiences. Uh, and as you can see uh, on the image, in the image of that screen here, um, it's the actress Ellen Page who recently had her public coming out um, at a speech she delivered at a human rights conference. Uh, and it's available uh, via YouTube. The link is shared here. Uh, it's about eight to ten minutes long, so it might be recommendable, recommendable to watch it several times. Um, and what the teaching idea entails that the students develop a word bank based on the language that is used in the video. Um, and this word bank contains vocabulary items that help students to talk about LGBT issues. Uh, and the approach to this video is quite normal or standard, um, simply to extract the information that Ellen Page shares about her experience as a lesbian actress in the Hollywood business. So it's pretty much something like a close uh, watching with extracting information here that is carried out by learners. Um, and in the next step, 
um, I wrote uh, a few so-called star profiles or celebrity profiles about uh, celebrities who identify as lesbian or gay. Uh, and the students engage with these profile or profiles and try to find out what their celebrity's job is, why she's famous, uh, what their celebrity's experience with coming out is, uh, and what the celebrities generally say about uh, being gay or lesbian. Uh, and in the next step, um, the students read uh, a newspaper article about the German football player uh, Thomas Hitzelsberger, who recently came out as gay, uh, to add uh, to the range of celebrities that are lesbian or gay. Uh, and the overall uh, task outcome would be to write a magazine article for the fictitious magazine Celebrities Today, uh, in which the students collect everything they learned about both positive and negative experience of these celebrities with coming out and with being gay uh, as a public, publicly visible celebrity. Um, OK, these are were the um, practical implications and teaching ideas. Uh, let me conclude with a few remarks that I gathered from the future uh, teachers that I taught when they were students at university. Uh, sometimes I give uh, university seminars on creating English language teaching. Uh, and what I usually do is I ask my students to write reflective logs or diaries in which they think further about uh, the content um, and the knowledge that I conveyed in my university classrooms. Uh, and I selected uh, three opinions that my students stated, uh, which can provide further food for thought for you as teachers in Brazil. One is, but this is what I want to stand for as a teacher. For instance, open-mindedness and tolerance towards LGBT people. Uh, and I think what we can take from this opinion is that all teachers who teach English have to ask themselves, what do they want to stand for? Uh, another quote reads, uh, involving queer approaches to English language teaching, which, which do have so many different facets, obviously can be done in numerous ways. But which ones are suitable for which group of learners and for which age? And last but not least, with which ones can I, as a teacher, with my own personality deal? Uh, and this quote, for my opinion, illustrates quite well that each and every teacher has to decide for themselves what suitable approach to queer English language teaching would be for them in their respective context, context with their respective learners. Uh, and the last quote reads, uh, I have very often asked myself whether other fellow students who do not attend this seminar will use queer themes and materials in their sessions. Uh, most of the students who want to become a teacher do not learn that queer topics uh, could be related to ENT. Um, and from my perspective, this quote shows quite well that sometimes what is really necessary in teacher education is to raise awareness that queer themes do have a place in English language education. Uh, and sometimes all is needed is this awareness that can push teachers further, further to think about um, the kind of requirements of their profession. Um, my talk comes to an end here. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope that I could inspire you to uh, a few new uh, ideas to, to live up to the great challenge of querying English language education in Brazil. Um, and as far as I'm right, you will now have the chance to ask a few questions. Yes, thank you very much, Austin. It was very, very, very interesting, your talk. Uh, let's get to the people who want to ask questions. Who wants to ask a question to Thorsten, people? Anyone in the room? Ana Julia? Luziani? Mark? What about in, in the YouTube channel? Yes, the, there is a question coming from you to about the use of the term queer because mm -hmm. um, Christina said a thing was under the impression that queer was an offensive term. Mm -hmm. So um, she would okay. like. Mm -hmm. um, is that all? Okay. Yeah, that, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, the thing with queer is that uh, it can have multiple meanings. Historically speaking, uh, queer has been used as um, a word 
for insulting people who identify as LGBT. Um, and um, queer as a word has not completely lost um, this old meaning of being an insult. Uh, but what happened in the 1990s is that in political activism, queer has been reclaimed as a kind of positive marker of pride uh, to show that or, or to affirm LGBT identities in a positive, non discriminatory way so that. Uh, the people who were formerly insulted by this kind of reclaimed this about their own identity. Uh, and when I speak about queer approaches to language teaching, it's much more in the spirit of uh, these positive communications of the film. Uh, and when we look at it from the perspective of queer theory, uh, this on the one hand means to acknowledge uh, that LGBT identities in the first place do exist. Uh, and that we uh, stop their marginalization and exclusion and actually move them into the focus of attention. But it also has this um, critical notion that relates to the idea of heteronormativity, that relates to the idea of always calling into question and being critical of norms. So it's actually this kind of double power of function of queer to include LGBT identities, but at the same time to call into question the very norms that make LGBT identities seem to be excluded from the mainstream. Okay, so it has a, a variety uh, of meanings um, that certainly interact and sometimes when we use queer to give a title to our pedagogic agendas or visions, some people might actually be offended because it still has this negative connotation. Uh, so it's probably up to us to explain that we claim or use the word queer in a more positive empowering, emancipatory, and liberating uh, way. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Tarsen, mm -hmm. we have another question coming from YouTube from, mm -hmm. from Sergio, who is going to be our speaker too. He's asking if you've ever had any backlash teaching queer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. um, to be honest, I never had any negative backlash when it comes to teaching queer. Um, and this is something, um, if I really think about it, uh, is probably very, or can be seen as very positive. Um, whenever I kind of introduce queer topics in the classes that I teach, in the workshops that I visit, uh, I'm always a bit concerned how the people in these workshops might actually actually react to the new ideas of creating English language teaching. But why, what I encounter, at least speaking from my experience, is usually uh, a set of students who are really interested in the topic, who really want to learn something, uh, something new, something exciting, something that they never thought about beforehand. Uh, what I sometimes observe is a mild skepticism that usually the, the, the teachers that I teach to be teachers uh, ask themselves how on earth can I actually introduce queer themes in the classroom um, and those teachers who did teach queer in their teaching context uh, when they report back to me is usually that uh, neither teachers nor parents actually object to any teaching queer quite the opposite actually that uh, a lot of students reacted very positively. One teacher for example introduced uh, the LGBT themed novel uh, Boy Meets Boy by David Levithan in his year 10 in a very rural and Catholic area uh, in northern Germany uh, and other than he expected himself uh, in the first place uh, the teaching units went really well and the students really enjoyed reading the novel Boy Meets Boy, so that with all my experience that I have gathered so far is the idea of backlash or negative consequences uh, might sometimes be a big ghost that we imagine uh, in our heads, uh, but that when we actually teach queer loses a bit of its kind of mm, dr drama, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we have uh, another question coming from YouTube right now from Juliana Mata. He, mm -hmm. She's asking if you've uh, had uh, any, if you've ever faced 
any personal situation of people talking trash in class about gay people and uh, what what if so what did you do mm -hmm. mm. to be honest in all context that I've worked in so far um, I never had any situation in which anyone actually sp publicly uh, spoke ill about LGBT people um, maybe this points to the idea that for some weird way all the teaching context I've worked in uh, are very privileged and that the students or that I work with uh, are always uh, already very open-minded and wouldn't dare um, to speak ill about LGBT, LGBT people or make homophobic remarks. Um, maybe that's also because especially in my university context it's, it's socially very undesirable to come across as homophobic uh, so no one would actually be homophobic uh, in the context um, that I work in um, but as I tried to point out earlier if such a situation would occur uh, if such a situation occurred um, I think the most important thing is not to uh, sit idly by but actually to challenge what has been said and confront the students with the homophobic rem homophobic remarks uh, that they made so by the question I can probably only say that I'm very happy <laughs> that none of my students has ever been homophobic uh, and maybe this also indicates that the student population and teenagers are actually quite open-minded when it comes to teaching queer. Huh? I see. Uh, we have another question coming from YouTube from Andre, and uh, you sort of uh, talked about this already, but maybe he wants some more personal mm -hmm. opinion. It is mm -hmm. the question is how exposed should a gay teacher be to give visibility to the LGBT issues in ELT classes? Mm -hmm. So the question is about um, whether... As a gay teacher, how open yeah. should you be? Okay. Um, so I think we can approach that question from, from two perspectives. Um, generally, we could argue that all teachers, irrespective of their own sexual or, gen sexual or gender identity, um, could or should become open towards that topic so that all teachers kind of are ready and willing to actually introduce LGBT or queer themes into their classrooms. Uh, but I think the question was also about um, whether gay, lesbian, trans or bisexual teachers should actually come out to increase visibility um, and this very much reminds me of kind of the gay liberation movements in the 1970s or 80s where the logic of these movements was that the more people are publicly out, are out with uh, their parents and family members, uh, the more people actually know that LGBT, the more people know that LGBT people actually do exist would increase acceptance. Um, but I'm a bit careful to sell coming out as a pedagogic strategy because it's always a very personal decision uh, and from an LGBT activist point of view I can completely understand that the more LGBT teachers are actually out uh, the greater the visibility of LGBT people are also in view of role models uh, that these teachers might then become uh, but I'm very careful about let's put it bluntly forcing people to be out in their context. It's always a very personal and sensitive decision um, and uh, after a few conference talks that I delivered earlier um, I spoke to teachers about, uh, from Russia and Eastern Europe uh, and they told me that if they came out publicly at school they would lose their job, they would be fired um, and this is nothing that I would endorse, that teachers lose their job just because they feel that they need to come out. Okay. This is my personal opinion, but <laughs> okay. We have another question from from our moderator Rick. He's asking if you think it's easier to talk with teenagers or adults about queer issues. Mm. 
Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think um, um, what I learned from the student teachers that I prepared for their profession um, at university level and then when they actually entered school life is that they usually report back that teenagers are less, um, how can I put it, uh, prohibited and more honest about it. That what you get from these teenagers is a very honest, immediate response um, that they kind of suddenly make when queer issues are introduced, uh, but that these responses can sometimes be very kind of spontaneous, unexpected, uh, challenging the teacher to actually deal with these remarks. Whereas, in my own experience, adults go about queer issues maybe in a more cognitive way, less an emotional way. Um, um, but I would argue that you can talk about queer issues with teenagers and adults equally well. Uh, and based on my own experience, it's probably the, the spontaneity of the discussion that might be different, the, the emotional level versus the cognitive level that the discussion might have. Um, yeah. But probably this indicates that um, more research actually needs to be done uh, in view of what happens when teachers actually teach queer with certain age groups, how they react to these topics uh, in order to derive or arrive at some insights uh, how queer topics are discussed and negotiated in class. Okay. Okay, does anyone have uh, any other questions to Thorsten? Maybe here at the Hangout, maybe on YouTube? I believe Luciana wanted the link to the article, uh, an article that was mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, was it the was it Nelson's article with uh, practical ideas? Mm -hmm. um, the uh, magazine is called Language Issues, mm -hmm. um, and it's um, a mag. It's called. Hang on. Uh, the 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 people that put language is um, uh, published by Natekla, which is um, a British organization um, within the ELT sector, and it appeared in a 2015 issue uh, with several other articles also uh, focusing on the informed approach to language teaching. I think there are three or four articles. In the uh, which you might turn to. Mm -hmm. so some Just a moment, Bruno, because I, I had to mute you for a second because there was an echo on uh, on Thorsten's uh, reply, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to unmute you, uh, so we didn't hear what you say. Um, um, Do you want me to repeat my answer briefly? No, no, I think we, we could hear you. Okay. Um, I can I, I cannot I I can't seem to be able to unmute Bruno for some reason. I'm here. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> now, I think that Andrea, uh, he might have not listened to uh, his questions being answered, but that's okay. Uh, he can watch it later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can we wrap up? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for presenting our very first uh, event. It's a special event about uh, queer studies. It was a pleasure to, be, to have you here.
Thank and you. You, <laughs> you can come back someday, uh, and we hope to meet you in Rio, right, next year. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for having me. Thank you very much. So, guys, stay tuned because in uh, in a few minutes we will be uh, releasing the new link for uh, the next presentation, which will be given by Sergio Viola. Uh, it's uh, for two forty-five, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yes, and anyway, you can watch it on YouTube on our channel www.youtube.com/slash. Braille chat channel, uh, but we'll be releasing the link to the Hangout and the specific talk. Thank you, uh, Torsten. Thank you, Ila, for introducing him. Uh, it, it, it was, it's been lovely. It was yeah, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for providing me with space. Yeah. <laughs> See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.